I sew, knit, crochet. I subscribe to a magazine for weaving. This knife would do 75 deer real easy. I, I like Star Trek and I like um, Stargate and... If you'll buy me this house, you can put a pipe organ in it. Every one of them is an individual. No two coyotes are the same. When I picked up a tatting shuttle, I saw scenes from Pollyanna's. There's room for improving virtually every tool that man uses. Part of what makes Wyoming different are the people who live here. While some people's vacations last summer included trips to Yellowstone Park and Devil's Tower, ours took us deep into locals' garages and basements, where we found some of Wyoming's undiscovered treasures. Often self-taught, often making their own equipment from scratch. This is a loom that I built. These men and women pursue old and often ancient ways of doing things. From bladesmiths to tatters, from the traditional to the comical, <laughs> we found a whole world of folk arts in our own backyard. We introduce you now to four incredible folk artists who hone their crafts right here in Wyoming. My name is uh, Sonny Shoyo and I'm a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe. Being a drum keeper you have to be knowledgeable on the songs that you sing and you have to sing the appropriate songs for you know the dance categories and you know the singers that help me around the drum they're what you call backup singers and uh, they they um, rely on me as the lead singer drum keeper to uh, you know uh, start the song off and then they follow. The name of the drum group is Fox Trail, and uh, the members in the group, uh, they really range from, uh, you know, there could just be five of us, uh, mainly five of us, and then these other boys here on this reservation, they do help us out. You know, they, they come and they sit down with us, and, you know, there's usually between five to 11, 12 guys. The contest for the uh, singers is based on uh, drumming skills to see if the, the drumsticks are evenly as well as the songs. Let's, let's say there's 10 guys that are drumming and uh, you know there's one guy that's just kind of slacking or you know he's kind of like offbeat. The judges will look at that as uh, you know a markdown on their score. We've won prize money in the past at other powwows but we do not compete here because this is our own people's powwow, you know. So we're here just for the enjoyment of singing. A lot of people, they, they do record uh, record these uh, outstanding singers here. And, you know, they just use it down the road, you know, while traveling back home or at the house. You know, they'll put the live recording on. So when I was eight years old, um, I always uh, looked at my mother and her sisters. They um, had an old women's drum group. Uh, you know, looking at them, um, I decided that, you know, when I got older, I... I wanted to be where, you know, they were, you know, traveling all over, and so, uh, you know, my family's really proud. You know, being a lead singer, you know, I we, we, we try to, we carry ourselves with a, a respectful way, uh, you know, showing manners towards one another, showing manners towards, uh, you know, our elders and the dancers and spectators, you know, and people will look at a drum group as, you know, saying those boys over there are, you know, they're, they're good guys, you know, they're humble people, and that's the way I, I carry myself is in a humble way. So I made a lot of friends all over and uh, just trying to be a humble singer, you know, trying to be there for the people when they need me. You wrap the thread around the fingers of your left hand and clip it. I, I grew up with all these home folk artists and you pass the shuttle all the way under that thread between the first and second finger and bring it back over mother had a treadle sewing machine and I was sewing on her treadle sewing machine before I went to school I loosen the tension of the thread on my left hand as I pull the right hand tight and I only put the needle through my finger once you only do that once and then I re-establish while I hold the shuttle tight I, my hands go just almost as well as my mouth does <laughs> I reestablished the tension in my left hand. I did, I fell down one time while we were hunting and put my uh, crochet hook through my finger here. 
but it's a reverse. Didn't, I didn't dress the deer up that time. The first one I did was a half hitch one way. And I was the one left handed. I was the one that was born almost blind. This is a half hitch the other way. I was the one that gave my mother fits. She didn't know what to do about Mary. Again, I'm loosening the tension on the left hand and pulling the right hand tight. So I've decided that reestablishing the tension in the left hand and pulling it up firmly. It's okay to be different and I can be different. I can do things different and be creative and they'll be beautiful. <laughs> And this is the tin that this is going on, and I've tatted it specifically so that we can fasten it by putting the loops around the little flowers here, and that way it can be appreciated and can be looked at from both sides. And this is her Christmas cards this year. <laughs> so it's, it's used in clothing, it's used to trim handkerchiefs, pillowcases, bed sheets. It's all just a square knot. You just have to do them all the same way. It seems to have appeared in most of the seaports of Europe about the same time. In, in different countries, it's called different. Um, in, in Germany, it's called a word that means little boat because the shuttle that we use looks like a little boat. In, in French, it's called frivolity. In Finnish, it sounds, it's, it's a word again meaning little boat, but it sounds like you have to sneeze to say it. So my lips, twit. It depends on whether you want to call it nodding, or tatting, or frivolity, or shuffle flush whisk. Come on, we want to get you out here straight. I am animate, I will win. See my, my ring finger here? Yes. You can tell I tat. See the bump? And I exercise them, I, I stretch and strain just on purpose so that I keep limberness in them. Most of what I have done over my life is self-taught with helps from an occasional class along the way. Find a new technique or something that I needed to know and I'd go find a book. And that's why I've got a whole basement full of books because if you can't find it in one, you sure better be able to find it in another. <laughs> and besides that, by that time I found out how much fun it was just to sit down and spend an afternoon going through the books. This shelf is exclusively tatting. But this is probably what I would call more or less the workhorse of the shuttles. It's a clover shuttle. This is a Russian-made wooden shuttle, and the ends are really tight, and it's, it's really, really firm. And this is neat to load thread with a lot of beads on it. This was imported from the Philippines, and it's the water buffalo horn. This is the fish from Alaska. He got a nice smile. It's very, very portable. Everything you need for tatting will fit in a cigarette case. And it's much more productive, much more healthy use of a cigarette case. This is enough for thread and crochet hooks. And this has a cutting tool in it, scissors, spacers. Um, I've got a tablecloth over there if you want to look at it. I crocheted it, I didn't tab it. While I was working for TWA, I carried it with me on the airplane and uh, you know, I was traveling and I worked on it in the office and when I finally finished it, my supervisor said, Mary, we're gonna put that up on the wall and raffle it off because you did it on TWA time. <laughs> I've got fabric down there that I bought in New York City 30, 40 years ago. And uh, when I was working for the airlines, I went overseas and I brought pieces of fabric home and some of them are still down there and some of them I've used and, and uh, the Thai silk that I bought when I was in Thailand, I sewed almost all I have. Believe it or not, I know pretty much where anything and everything is. So I can go pretty much to where what I need to find. If I need a color, I got it. I've developed my own technique in tatting. Um, I do not see what it would look like if. What would it look like if? That's the really good question. What would it look like if? And that's what my first book was all about. What would it look like if? And I was just doing, um, they call them dimples. I have, I have fun. I just love doing the inner weaving because it's so much fun and it's neat to see what, what comes out. When I was a little kid, my grandmother used to read me stories about King Arthur and his knights. And I heard about, or she told me about Excalibur and how it was a falling star and the little people hammered it into a, a sword. And then the Lady of the Light presented it to King Arthur. And it was a knife that uh, would only serve an honorable man. 
but it was indestructible. And I decided that right then, probably about age five, that that was what I wanted to make, what I wanted to do. And it started in sixth grade, and I've been making knives ever since. Robert Henry writes a book uh, called The Art Spirit. And he says, when you paint, you paint with emotion. Your whole body goes with the brush. Your entire body moves. And he says, your emotion comes into the painting. My knives have that emotion. Uh, the emotion of what for, the emotion of why, the emotion of performance, uh, pushing the steel to the absolute limit. You read about people that get stranded out in the wilderness, uh, Fremont's expedition. Uh, they had to dig in the, in the ice, in the frozen ground for roots. Uh, dig a frozen otter out of the ice so they could get something to eat. Most of the guys starved to death. It was their knives that got them through. I carried it for seven years. It's dug in the dirt. It's been pounded on with rocks and hammers. I've had to dig horses out of the ditch. I've had to uh, cut head gate boards with a rock beaten on my knife blade. I chipped a sheep's head out of the ice. Uh, this knife, I could butcher, butcher a buffalo. I pulled myself off of a frozen river one time. It's my lifestyle gives me the opportunity to test the kind of knife that I want to make. I don't make kitchen knives and that kind of stuff. What I make is a survival knife. A survival knife that you could go hunting with, and if you get or hiking with and you get in a wreck, it'll get you out of it. And every, I have a, there's a reason for every aspect of the design of my knives, the geometry of the blades, the handle size, the shape. There's a reason for it, and those reasons have been learned by the state of Wyoming, by the Willowbow Ranch, and the opportunities that I have here in Wyoming. I'm very grateful to it. Eyes off of the end, and uh, this is, it's ready to become a knife now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang it up right here. I'm just... My grandfather taught me the importance of a knife, showed me how to sharpen one. We used to make rabbit traps and all kinds of garbage. But I started making knives back then, and then I continued off and on all the way through high school and college. And I was a cop in Fort Collins for a while, and I still made knives, and then when I came up here ranching, I had winter time, you have a little extra time. I bought it at an auction. No, I bought it from Ralph Herberkite, this one. Centuries ago, they had a steel called Woots. And Woot Steel was the strongest steel there ever was. General George Custer had a uh, Woot sword that he had liberated some, from some southern folk during the Civil War. And he could take that sword and grab it by the tip, bend the tip around to touch the handle, and let it spring back, and then spring back to true. That was Woot's. And that's what we've achieved. It's 52100 Woots, the qualities of the old Woots blade. It isn't real easy to achieve. I, I took a class under a man by the name of Bill Moran, who started the American Bladesmith Society. That's the best thing that happened to me. I made a knife in Bill's class, and the first one I made broke. When I went to flex it, it just went ping, and broke plumb in half. Bill says, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, no, this is great. Now I've got something to learn. And I came back, and for the first year that I made knives, Every knife that I made broke. Every one of them. I mean, I, I, I tortured every one of them to death until they broke. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Uh, but uh, I have a brand new shop sitting right behind you. And yeah, right down the center line of that shop are over 300 experimental blades buried down in the ground underneath the cement slab. My shop stands on it. The knives that I make today stand on it. Now they do not break. I don't think I'm doing anything new. I think old timers knew it a long time ago. Uh, there's a book by Stephen Vogel called Cat's Paws and Catapults. And he talks about the natural structures, the plants that grow in the sea and flow back and forth with the tides. So I started, I made some knives that way and put them in a vise and flexed them. And I found that I could have maximum strength toward the tip of the blade, a nice slicing cutting edge in the front part, 
uh, a finer slicing edge in the back part with uh, a thinner part of the blade that allow it to flex, just like those weeds do. Okay, okay, Mother Nature shows us. And it's all there. You, you can lay down and watch a piece of grass blow in the wind for a day. And you see why it's triangular shaped real quick. You can watch a sunflower turn as the sun turns. You can, even grass does it. I mean, wow, wow, okay. On September 17th, 1979, I gave myself my most important birthday present ever. I turned off the TV. I have not watched a full network television program since then. You cannot believe how much time that gave me. I can sit down, I can read. Every night I spend an hour with my friend Henry David Thoreau. I have Thoreau's journals put out by Princeton University. Uh, Thoreau fortifies my, uh, my interest in nature, my interest in my love for the trees, for the grass, for e everything here in Wyoming. I'm, uh, just walking out there with my dog, changing water, watching the grass, watch as it dries up, begging for moisture, moving the water down and giving it a drink when it needs it. Uh, laying down under a big old cottonwood tree and taking a nap in the afternoon when I want to be alone, just me and my dog. I was irrigating one fall. The Sandhill Cranes, there's a pair of them out here, they danced for me. I sat there and watched them for probably a half an hour. What, what a display, wow. And what, what an honor to participate in it. It's, it's freedom in its ultimate expression, the ability, if I want to go to sleep at one in the morning, I can. If I want to go to sleep at two in the afternoon, I can. Uh, the crops, Mother Nature, that's my boss. You can fight nature and you'll lose. Or you can learn to live with her and you find life is really lovely. It's been very rewarding, but, but I have a lot of time to make things and create and do what I want to do. Uh, it's freedom. If you look at my knives, I don't consider them really to be art. But here we have steel from the earth. The handle is uh, an animal that lives on the surface of the earth. And this engraving, that's just a graphic representation of the vegetable material that allows all of the life that's on earth to exist. This knife is meant to stick, to penetrate, to go in deep. That, that's its total design. It's absolutely dedicated to be a fighter. It is my tribute to the people, the fighters, throughout the history of man who have had the courage to stand up for rational beliefs. The whistleblower who stands up and uh, talks about government waste. The corporate executive that goes to the executive board and fights for a janitor that was fired. The little kid on the playground that takes on the school bully. To the original thinkers, to the Einsteins, who could put up with people thinking they were crazy and didn't know what they were talking about. The people who have made a difference for the benefit of mankind. That's what this knife is for. It's a tribute to them. I mean, wow. Wow, uh, uh, that's what I'm making it for.